All right, good evening. It's 5.30 on Monday, February 5th, 2024. I'm calling to order the Town of Rutland Select Board and Board of Public Works meetings. We are meeting in the lower level of the Rutland Public Library. Um, we, in person, is Harry Seckman and myself, Leah Whiteman. We have on Zoom Jen Ledger and Tom Galvin. Um, unfortunately, Paul is unable to be in attendance tonight. He has a prior significant commitment with the Masons, so that's exciting for him. Um, and we have Austin, our town administrator, and Tamika, our executive assistant here as well. Um, we are open. Let's start with the pledge, and then we'll go to executive session. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I would take a motion to enter into uh, executive session for reason number three, which is to dis discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. For A, Massachusetts Commission Against, a mis against a mis Discrimination Case Update, and B, Police Sergeants and Patrolmen's Unions, Discussion of Negotiations for Contract Expiring on June 30th, 2024, to return to open session. So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. We'll do a roll call. Harry. Second, aye. Yeah, aye. Okay. Okay. Galvin. Roger, aye. Okay, perfect. Whiteman, aye. Thank you, guys. We are in executive session. Uh, okay, welcome back. Thanks for everyone's patience. It's 6, 637. We are back in open session. Um, this is the Rutland Select Board and Board of Public Works meeting for Monday, February 5th. Um, we have minutes, treasury warrant, and payroll to approve, so I would take a motion to approve Treasury Warrant 24-16 and Payroll 24-PW16. So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns, anything of significance, Austin? Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Hearing none, roll call Harry. Second, aye. Ledger, aye. Galvin, aye. Whiteman, aye. Thank you. Um, we have the meeting, and I think Austin had just asked Jen and Tom if one or both of you, or if Paul ends up watching, can stop up tomorrow to sign um, the Treasury Warrant and Payroll so that we can make sure we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we have the approval of meeting minutes January 22nd, 2024, which was a regular meeting. Um, everyone was present. So moved. Motion to approve was from Tom. Is there a second? Second. Second. Anyone have any questions, comments, concerns, revisions? I, um, I have one, I guess, comment slash question. Um, has to do with the, the discussion that we had with the Finance Committee on the the warrant for the, the bylaws. I know we there was a concern brought up because the finance committee was being asked to provide their recommendation for bylaws that they weren't necessarily there for all the discussion or had not gone through and read all of the revisions. I don't know if that's, I, I guess my two part question, one being, do we, should we note any of that in the minutes or is there a way that for down the road for the new bylaw committee. Again, if the finance committee is gonna be expected to make a recommendation to put something on the warrant, should they be included in any future discussions? I just, I don't wanna, I don't want to um, glance over their concerns that they were being asked to provide a favorable recommendation for something that they may not have been 100% clear on without attending any of the, the information sessions or reviewing everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think throughout the process, there's been some 
back and forth as to how the process has worked and how much kind of control everyone should have versus, you know, it's a it's a committee charged with bringing forth changes and how, you know, how that works. Um, I don't know. I would be fine if we, if the board was wanted to put in just a comment. And I would want to go back and kind of watch that section or ask Tamika to watch that section of the um, – the conversation to make sure that it's captured accurately, but I do, there may be some value to just note kind of some of the frustration around the process, um, mm -hmm. more so as moving forward with a seated, full, like permanent bylaw committee to work mm -hmm. towards. Yeah, and I, I think that's fine. That would that would address my my concern. Like I said, I just I I do want to acknowledge their that concern from the fin finance committee and like I said, moving forward with the new bylaw committee, is there a way that we can improve that process? So to me, I'm not sure if you feel like it's the best to amend the, the current minutes or if just note in our comments tonight about our minutes that we had, because we didn't really talk about the frustration of the policy and how to address it go or the process and how to address it going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if maybe Jen, if it makes more sense to just have it noted in our meeting tonight that there has been, I personally all weekend have been feeling frustrations from residents about the process. So I think that it's not only FinCom. Um, and so if there's documentation somewhere that can then be kind of shepherded to the bylaw committee, the permanently seated bylaw committee for feedback. Are you amenable to that? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with making a comment in tonight's minutes, that's fine. Is the rest of the board okay with that also? Sure. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, sounds good. is everyone okay approving the minutes as presented for the meeting of the 22nd? We have a motion and a second, so we can go roll call. Harry? Suckman, I. Ledger, I. Galvin, I. Whiteman, I. Thank you. I appreciate that comment, um, Jen, because I think it's important. Um, member comments and announcements. I want to move quickly because I would like, we have some ARPA plan funding stuff that I would like to have at least Tom on because um, Paul's not here. So I'll move quickly. Um, I just wanted, I've had some feedback recently um, that certain, that members of some committees are reaching out to town administrator, town staff, department heads for information that maybe their entire board or committee is not work, looking for or doesn't know about. And so I would just like to reiterate that in all forms of town government, we govern as bodies and not as individuals. And so if it's requests, if we can try to funnel them through the chair of whatever it is, not as gatekeepers, but more so the town staff isn't being bombarded with the same request for information, but also that the entire member of that body has access to the same information. Um, so I would just like to, to put out there um, if possible. Um, and again, it's not, I don't view it as a gatekeeping, but it's more of that governing as a town, as a, as a body, um, a member body. Um, and well, also, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm understanding you, so can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Can can you, or well, it will open up a can of worms if you do? Well, no, but I think, I mean, I think just in certain instances, a member of some committee. A may, member, not the chairman. Correct. Okay. May reach out to a department head or to our office, to Tamika or Austin, asking for information. Nine times out of ten, it's totally warrant. Like it's fine, even more than probably than nine times out of ten. But it's sometimes multiple members are reaching out for that same information, uh -huh. and so it, yeah. if it goes through the chair of that committee, you know, if CIPC wants information, and four of your members would all like the same information rather than have four of your members email. Right. Right. Then it comes through you, and also then it can be disseminated to the entirety of that board or commission. I get you. Okay. For the for, for information's sake, rather than hounding a department head or our office or Austin or or whatever the case may be, and so okay. it's more just as we the municipal government government governs as a member body, and so to try to provide that. Okay. So does that clarify? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Um, and also, I attended the Mass Munici Municipal, Municipal Association's annual meeting um, a couple weeks ago in Boston. 
and I went to a few. It's a great learning and networking opportunity. I didn't really spend any time, unfortunately, at the trade show um, because I was a lot in the learning sessions um, when the trade, sh trade show was going on. Um, I do have a list of all the companies and organizations who are at the trade show, and I think that they can provide some good resources um, and outside-the-box thinking for town. Um, I, Ali, our HR coordinator was there for Friday and she attended, um, a few sessions and then Austin was there for the weekend as well and attended other sessions. We, generally, we try whomever goes to kind of hit different sessions so we can bring back the same information or different information. Um, most of the handouts, I think Austin and I and Ali probably have access to if anybody looks at the itinerary and is interested in whatever hap whatever the topic was there may be presentations and or handouts that we would happily be able to share. Um, I attended one uh, learning session on equitable engagement, best practices in blind spots, kind of how to um, bring fresh ideas and fresh perspectives into existing boards and committees, into the organization um, and whatever. Um, one thing was that it's not really, like, we're not inviting somebody to our table. It's everybody's table. And so it's kind of just trying to, to change that I think we are always saying we need more volunteers, new volunteers, different volunteers. Um, and it can be intimidating because sometimes we think that we're very opening and welcoming of someone who doesn't necessarily know, but in practice it can be very intimidating. Um, and so just being aware that can kind of be a blind spot. Um, and then also, if there's populations of people that we think are missing from important conversations, how we can maybe reach to engage them. So I know Austin and um, the town clerk's office have been really trying to make time to get to the senior center because that might not be an easy avenue for our um, those residents to attend meetings here or participate via Zoom or whatever, but to share information and get feedback. Um, and so continue that kind of outreach, maybe targeted things. Um, in the past, for some boards and committees, we've done weekend stuff because we, we've tried to be mindful of sports and everything. And if people could pop in while they're out running kids or whatever, or so, you know, being a little bit more thoughtful and targeted, and it might take a little bit more time but then there's um, there's another layer of engagement, and you're creating more uh, welcoming and opportunities for people to feel like they we want to hear from them. Um, I attended one on Beacon Hill Basics, how to be your municipality's best advocate. They said make sure it's clear, concise, and actionable messaging. And again, they've said, be ready for asks. Like your, our um, state legislature is going to ask us, do you have a five-year capital plan? What is it? Where does this fit in? They may ask for engineering or plans or they, we heard this in, I think I made a comment a couple times about some of the like land conservation stuff. And they're like, you don't have CPA. So until you show, they want to see that there's some level of investment from the town, um, for whatever the ask is or whatever the, that engagement is. And then in, when when good things happen, <laughs> invite them back to have like a cel celebratory event or something um, because it really is a two-way street and they sometimes get bombarded with asks and it can be hard to not have that, that reciprocal. Um, but really they said it needs to be clear, concise, and actionable um, because they get bombarded with so much. Um, and then I went to one called Unlocking Federal Funds. As we all know, there's a whole lot of federal money available um, and the best ways um, to kind of tap into those. Um, it's not, it, it's, there's a lot of work that needs to go into it. The state has provided a lot of great resources. They have a whole um, department at the state level to help. Um, and the municipal, um, the regional planning commission has received a lot of funding as well to assist in getting these projects forward. They really were pushing by, start by looking at your town's priorities and projects, and then look to see how the federal funding 
can be applied to those and not go, don't go looking for the funding and then try to piece things together. Really start with your projects and then go looking for the funding because it gets overwhelming if you're trying to chase funding rather than having a comprehensive package. Um, the um, A lot of the funding has additional incentives um, for green communities, kind of green projects. Um, so I think it was Lynn maybe received a very large package for um, electric school buses. And also not only did they get the electric school buses, they got the chargers to go with the electric school buses. So every bus got a charger. Um, and so there's different tiers of funding. And if you meet different levels of of work or uh, opportunities, then you can unlock more and more funding. Um, so it's again, not, it's very, there's a whole lot of details, um, but we really need to look at the, the, the projects and priorities that we have before looking for the funding. So that was the bigs. Those were the three sessions where there were three, three learning sessions, an opening meeting, um, an opening session, and then, um, the business meetings and everything. So the opening session was kind of unlocking the or the governor's preliminary budget and kind of really the governor and lieutenant governor did a lot of work in the late summer and fall to go through and visit a lot of the municipalities and towns throughout the Commonwealth and tried to take a lot of that feedback um, and some of the, the options or um, things that they're looking to offer the the municipalities, not just the Boston or the Worcester or the Springfield, but the smaller communities also. So I don't know if Austin, you had anything. Um, one quote that I keep saying <laughs> that I think I kind of have said throughout, not in this concise, is without data, all you have is an opinion. And that was really kind of reiterated kind of throughout the conference. And so I think we've been pushing kind of where's the data? Let's let's look at the data and use that to drive some of our decisions. Um, and that was just kind of reiterated throughout the conference as well. Um, I think we've been we've had a few snowstorms. I'm going to wrap up the MMA stuff. We've had a few snowstorms and I think. DPW has been dealing with a lot of road issues um, with the freeze stalls and the, road, the snow and the rain and everything. So if there's any concerns, by all means, reach out to one of us, to Austin, to Tamika, or to DPW directly, and they can get eyes on it. There's a lot of roads in town, so it's not that we can all get eyes on everything all at once. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add, there's a spot on the website, a report concern um, and that goes directly to us or to whichever department is appropriate um, and we have been receiving some that way so that's probably the most efficient way awesome to reach the right folks awesome yeah thank you you're welcome yeah please take advantage of the website as much as possible um, and then I just wanted to kind of thank everyone for the work that they've been doing we've been we had our preliminary budget thing so thanks to all uh, Immense thanks to Austin and Tamika for getting that ready um, and the department heads because it's a, a big team effort on that respect. Um, I know CIPC and FinCom have been involved as well, so there's a lot of coordinating that goes into that. So thank you, Austin, for, for that. And as we go forward um, in the next couple weeks, I'm sure we'll fine-tune. Um, does any other... Um, member have any announcements or comments? Okay. Um, is there anyone here for public comment? There's no one. Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> Wait in the back. Like, there's no one in right now. Hmm. See, there's maybe one or two on Zoom, but um, <laughs> hearing none, if anybody has anything pop up, but um, we'll move into the town administrator update. And Austin, if I might ask if yep. we can start with the ARPA stuff. Yep. Is that okay, Tom? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will agree it was a great conference. Um, a lot of good things, as always, with that conference. But just to start with the ARPA, so uh, it was my intent to, to um, ask the board to consider as a whole um, ARPA requests that were incorporated from um, CIPC's recommendations, staff recommendations, um, because uh, one, Paul is missing, and I know Tommy will have to uh, shoot out soon. 
Um, I'll be deferring that to a future meeting. However, uh, some things that are time sensitive or budget sensitive, I um, am hoping the board will consider uh, the following request with respect to ARPA. So um, there was approximately um, 2.2 million in spending that was approved. Um, approximately 1.5 million of that has been spent. Still, 682,000 is available for some projects. However, there are some projects uh, that are included in the in the packet that have been completed, and we're requesting the board to close out those projects and make those balances available for um, reappropriation, if you will. I can go through quickly what those projects are, but just the total of that is twenty eight thousand. $28,649.02. Uh, so just quickly, it's the water line extension, um, funds associated with the water line extension for Pomagusset Road, um, funding for town-wide overtime, a study to evaluate water infiltration, infiltration at the public safety facility and the library, uh, costs associated with searching for a new town administrator, uh, costs associated with the food pantry at the community center, um, eminent domain uh, costs for the TIP project, premium pay stipends for staff, uh, matching an ambulance grant, and um, stamping uh, from an engineer for ADA plans at the community center. Again, those projects that have been completed and can be closed out total $28,649.02. Um, it's also our understanding um, COVID has not gone away. And um, we see some increases in some of the um, uh, public health assistance related to the flu, for example. Uh, the nurse and su support staff contracted services line item, um, I think, has about $4 left in the available budget. So we're asking for $2,000 increase to the um, supplies and services line item for the public health nurse and support staff um, to purchase new supplies, COVID tests, things like that. And also, this is a new project that I'm asking the board to consider, is funding to support assessors' contracted services for personal property valuation. This was a request that was included in, in the assessor's FY25 budget. However, as you know, due to some of the challenges we have from budgets, I'm asking the board to consider utilizing ARPA funds for this. This will bring in uh, an outside vendor, RRC, to assist the assessor's office with personal property valuation. We believe that not only this will pay off, um, but we'll we'll see increased tax revenue, hopefully for this upcoming year. They can essentially, if the boarding uh, approves this, uh, we can sign that tomorrow and they can get started as soon as possible um, to uh, to kind of get us caught up on on some personal property valuation, uh, which ultimately leads to additional tax revenue. Um, so approximately twenty thousand dollars in requests for increases and twenty eight thousand dollars in closeout balances. Um, if approved, um, approximately $445,000 will remain unallocated um, in addition to the $600 and some thousand dollars that are still available for previously approved projects. So I will come to a future board meeting for um, the rest of this calendar year funding plan, but just if the board has an interest in, um, in approving the request tonight, again, to close out and approve increases or uh, a uh, approval for the new line and for the assessor's office. Happy to answer any questions on that. Uh, just so I, I'm clear, Austin, the you said there was 682,000 available in ARPA funds that wasn't allocated. No, so so there's 445,000. If if this is approved, there'll be 445,000 not allocated to any projects. The 682,000 are for projects that were previously approved. So, for example, the secondary water source study, okay. um, or um, you know, like the uh, energy costs, um, scope of work for uh, work done at the library. So, previously approved projects okay. that have not seen any action yet. So, there's still balances available for those open projects. Okay. So all in all, if you would ask what we have cash on hand, it's approximately $1.1 million between unallocated and balances available. Okay. So 445 would still... Now, after these things have been requested and looking at the CIPC capital projects for Harper, we had looked at it and said, once we give you our stuff, there should be around 60000 or so still available in the fund. So even with our stuff, this 445 won't be used up completely. Okay. 
I say our stuff, I mean CIPC. And there are some, so that for example, this assessors, I do have some other um, items that I'd like to request the board to consider that are a response to some of your goals. So employee appreciation is, is one, improving employee morale. So I'll be asking uh, the board at a future meeting to consider those requests. But because these are time sensitive and also I would like the, whole, the board as a whole to consider, um, especially some of those newer projects um, at the request of the chair, I've, I'll defer that until a future meeting. And one last question, 18,000, not, I'm not worried about that number, yep. but funding to support assessors, contracted services for personal property, is that where we're going out to hire somebody that can help us increase the personal property valuation in the town or get better data for that? Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of both, right? So it is getting better data. It's also taking a look at our data and seeing if it is appropriate in terms of valuation. So for example, if... Um, if our records say a printer is valued at $500, and this company knows full well that the printer in the marketplace is $1,500, they'll adjust it appropriately to the market. So it's just something that because of limited staffing, Amy and her office do not have the resources to do so. This is a common thing for cities and towns. They, they hire this vendor. They're a pretty prominent vendor in the marketplace, um, and their specialty is personal property. And the reason I say 18000 to me isn't an issue is because the return on that 18000 investment yeah. is far above the 18000 Yep. to make things right. Yeah. Okay. And something, uh, I, and something I'd like to, you know, I was, I'm sorry, Jen, um, just would like to include in future budget requests, um, but just obviously, you know, we, we asked departments to level fund their budgets, and this was one that um, we thought would be appropriate, especially we think it would be a one-year you know, kind of hit, if you will. So um, ARPA as a one-time funding source, we think would be appropriate to kind of get us at a, in a good position on personal property. Okay. Sorry, Jen. Uh, can you clarify for, for that, that item? Is, it, is the company going to go out and get updated values or are they actually going to assist with updating the system with those values? Because I know that's also been a challenge. <clears throat> the assessments are done, but actually getting those entered into the system so that they take effect. Yeah, so again, it, that, that one, the answer to that is also, it's a little bit of both. So okay. uh, getting new values from the marketplace and also working with Amy in her office to um, get those into the system and also essentially providing her with a, this is a really um, rough description of it, but essentially a new spreadsheet of values that she can utilize in future years for personal property. I mean, uh, again, if that will help stabilize our personal property values so we can, on a year-to-year -year basis, look at what that value is coming into the town without it up and down, yeah. well worth the money, in my opinion, anyways. Yeah, and if, they, if they're able to get started um, as soon as possible, we believe that we'll be able to um, also modify our FY25 um, revenue budget slightly into the positive, so... Again, I, hopefully we can sign this ASAP and get them in here. So. Okay. Um, Austin, do you know uh, how often is this usually done? You know, we're saying it's a, a one one time line item, but I mean, assessed values do change over time. So how how often or how yeah how often do they usually do this typically? Um, so like we have a cyclic cyclical obligation to do essentially. I think it went from. Was it five years to three years? So essentially, we have to do a third of the town every year. So the whole town has to be essentially um, reassessed, if you will, every three years. Um, I think there's a slight difference in personal property, but we have an expectation to do this um, in some capacity every year. Um, now, this will be a huge catch-up on personal property. Um, but, you know, I think it's a goal as well of, um, of me and for Amy in her office is to allocate some funds in her budget every year for personal property and just overall contracting services for, um, for valuations. So, um, you know, something that hopefully we can include in next year's budget prep process to make sure that we're staying in line with this. But this will at least get us caught up to um, today and all the previous years where we haven't been able to do this. But um, yeah, Jen, we, get, we have to do this essentially every year. Um, Leah, I apologize. I'm going to have to uh, sign off. Um, okay.
I'm, I'm comfortable with, with voting okay. with that uh, list Austin had. Okay. Thank you. Sorry we didn't get to the vote, but we'll make a note. Sorry, that, Tom. I talked too much. <laughs> we'll make a note that, right. that you were comfortable in a favorable, but not here for the vote itself. Yeah, if, no, I'm totally comfortable with what he read off, and uh, I apologize for having to leave. No, and, I appreciate uh, I'll talk to you guys at the next meeting. All right, thanks. I appreciate you being here. Good luck. All right, thanks. Um, when we do this on an annual basis, we send out a request for information, correct? It's like three or four sheets. Uh, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Um, yeah, I, so, yeah, so I'm not totally familiar with the uh, assessor's process, but I, I do know that, for example, with some of the, like, rental properties, um, they ask for information um, in terms of, you know, what your what's your income and, and things like that to, to try to get it in line with the market. Um, but again, some of it is also we, we look at personal property, um, whether it's through a survey or just we look at what's in our records and we make sure that what we have for values are appropriate with the marketplace. So some of it is just also general assumptions. Um, and then some of it is, is um, the information that we have for data. Yeah, I mean, the only downside I can see is the fact that if you're sending this out, if you walk on somebody's property and you see they got a 40-foot boat sitting there, well, you know that's personal. Okay, that's hard. But to know what you have inside your house, even if you're running a business, it depends on their honesty to fill this thing out, to really. So, I, I mean, I think it'll improve, but I don't trust the exact figures. Yeah, that's that's a good point, Harry, because I'm sure that there's quite a few people that have, you know, done home improvements that are not on record. And how do we. Yeah, I thought that was part of, you know, some of this assessment process where, you know, you need to see how much of your living space is actual square footage. And the more you've got, the higher your value goes up. But how do we determine that just by looking at what you see on the records? I, I mean, just kind of thinking outside the box here. One way to figure out if things weren't on the paperwork the way they should have been is at the sale of the house if they sell it. Now we go in and evaluate and say, hey, you've had all this stuff along. We're going to charge you for that, that you lied to us, so to speak. Not lied, but you forgot to put it down. Okay. I mean, yeah. you know, this... Amy, since Amy's been on as a full-time assessor, I think she's contracted also, and there's been assessors that have gone out to homes and done an exterior inspection. It's always dicey as to what you can do on the interior side. Yeah, right. Um, and and even that, I think, has landed a, a significant change in a lot of properties. Um, so I think just kind of showing the commitment that that – we're willing to put the effort in. We're willing to spend a little bit of money to try to realize some additional significant tax mm -hmm. revenue um, for the town is and without having to go as a two and a half to everybody that doesn't have. Yeah, we got we to gotta somehow prove to the town that we're doing things other than just asking them for two and a half all the time. And Austin, I have no... I personally have no problem with any of this. My only kind of question comment, and it's not a question, it's more just of a comment, is I, this is a lot of projects under the closeout completed projects kind of line item. And it's a, it's the most of the three requests. It's the m most of the request. Um, but just to make sure that obviously some of these, there were other um, in instant incurrences that weren't necessarily um, expected, un unexpected, but just to make sure that there's not anything that's totally out of, um, totally off the wall. I know that there had been in the past a few things that have gone significantly over budget. Um, and I don't want to, I think for most, for, for this, over the course of however many projects, 28,000 is totally reasonable in my mind, yeah. but I also just want to make sure that there's not a, a history of certain projects getting significantly overspent or without regard to a budget or anything, mm -hmm. if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I guess that, to me, that would fall under the $682,000 that's been asked for but not yet spent. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jen, did you have any other um, questions or any comments or anything about it? 
Um, I don't, I don't think so. Um, and all right, Austin, I'm looking at the spreadsheet that you gave us a while ago on the ARPA funds. <clears throat> and I thought there were some even older ones, other older articles that, or is that separate from what we were talking? That's not ARPA funds. That's yeah, just, this is separate. Allocated. You're talking about okay. kind of the open town meeting articles. Yeah. That's yeah. What I, okay. Separate. Yeah. So that, that will be a, as a part of the, um, kind of the final budget presentation. I think we mentioned okay. it the other night, CIPC yeah. is recommending um, reappropriating some of those articles. So as we kind of work through this process, um, okay. we'll try to be creative with things that can be reappropriated, um, taking into account some of the recommendations that came in from CIPC too. But okay. I figured we'd start with ARPA. Yeah, that's that's fine. I just, thank you for clarifying that. Yep. Just wanted to get it straight. Is there any other Questions, concerns, conversation? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the um, town administrator's ARPA request as presented. So moved. Second. So we have this a motion. Is easy. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any other conversation? No. Hearing none. <laughs> Harry, we'll do roll call. Okay, second. Ben, I. Ledger I. And Whiteman I. And if we can just document that Tom wasn't able to participate at the end of the conversation and vote, yep. but that at the time of leaving, he was amenable also. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so just um, so the, the uh, report was sent to the board and also uh, is included on the town administrator's webpage. I'll just quickly roll through um, some of the high level items. Um, I want to announce that we do have an interim treasurer collector starting next week. Um, after going through the recruitment process and unable to come to negotiations with a candidate, um, recognizing that we, uh, Becky is retiring at the end of the month, we are uh, working, we'll be working with an interim treasurer collector. His name is Steve Barrett. He's the retired finance director and treasurer collector from the town of Acton. He also previously owned his own municipal audit firm auditing Massachusetts uh, cities and towns. Um, he's been in the business for 20 plus years, uh, is well versed in, in not only treasurer collector uh, responsibilities, but overall town finance responsibilities. So we'll be able to assist us in the transition um, and we'll uh, begin that re recruitment process immediately. And, and I think Steve can, uh, can help us. He'll be starting uh, on Monday, February 12th. So if you are around and want to stop by and meet Steve, um, we'll be happy to see you. I'll also see if he'll be able to be there for the Finance Committee um, budget hearing that night as well. Um, the police and fire departments are holding... Can we back up to questions? Sure. What was the reason or why have we not been able to hire a treasurer? Um, is it, are we not competitive? Are they don't like to travel to the middle of the state? What's going on? Why? So... We fi we're finding in, in general that the market for new employees is incredibly competitive, especially in municipal finance. Um, I think that overall responsibilities of the position are um, you know, fairly equal to our peers. However, the compensation um, is not. So I think that we have to retool and, and look at some other opportunities um, for treasurer collector, um, but the, the marketplace for compensation for municipal finance is much higher than I think where we are right now. Much higher? Yeah. Even with what we're paying now? Yeah. Really? I was going to say, what, what are we looking at? Um, <laughs> Upwards of? Up, uh, uh, let's say over $100,000. Yeah. And I will say at MMA even, it was kind of the chatter among um, the, the attendees that especially treasurer collectors and finance is, uh, really a, um, underrepresented pool of candidates at the municipal level. Um, and there were a number, I was impressed. There were a number of students at the MMA. So there, the state is recognizing that the municipal pool of candidates is not there and trying, I think, trying to network with, um, students, college students who are, who are interested in municipal government to draw them in 
that's not going to solve the problem right now. Um, I talked to a number of treasure collectors and I was like, do you know people? And they're like, no, we have a list of people that are banging on our doors trying to kind of steal us from our very well established positions. Um, so I think it's currently a nature of, of the beast. And, um, so I think Austin and the team of maybe trying to be a little bit creative as far as the position, the hours, the responsibilities, um, and how to, there's a whole lot of municipal requirements to be a treasure collector. We can't get over that. That's a good thing. We can't get over it. Um, but you know, it's not trying to find any loophole, but it's trying to be creative. Um, if we're paying them that much money, are we considering, are you considering looking at a financial director's position then? I mean, uh, we're paying a lot just for that one position. Yeah, so I, I think to, to Leah's point, I think that this is an opportunity as well to take a look at the position. I think um, the position will probably look functionally very different than what it is now. And it already has changed a little bit since we've hired, for example, um, uh, an, an accountant to be here. We have a payroll and AP assistant. We have uh, an HR coordinator. So, you know, there's three positions that um, have taken some responsibilities that used to be all handled through Becky or her office. Okay. So I think in terms of um, the uh, recruitment, the, the recruitment process now, I think we'll also probably just have to make sure that the job description is aligned with taking out some of those responsibilities as well. But I don't know if, if a finance director is needed at this time. Okay. Yeah. So, you, know, you know where I'm coming from? Yeah. You're paying 100, 120 a year just for a treasurer collector? Yeah. That's, that's a lot. In this town, that's a lot of money. Yeah, but if we're not being competitive and we're not going to be able to get somebody in based on what the current market rates are, I guess uh, my question being, are we modifying the job description so that we can offer no. increased salary or are we trying to modify it to justify the current salary? Yeah, no, I think so when, um, when I think Becky first notified us, we just had, we just started with Allie as the HR coordinator. Um, I think even Lindsay and payroll was still just getting started. So there st were still a lot of things that were and still are being handled by Becky. Um, now, I think obviously with a couple of months with both of those positions, we're seeing some efficiencies that can be made um, with the addition of those offices. So just being a little bit more realistic to where we are and where we think we're going to be and also just looking at um, the industry as a whole and um, who is handling what. So um, the payroll and AP assistant right now is only doing payroll, but it has AP assistant in the job description. So can it take more on some of the accounts payables as well um, that maybe is, is handled through Becky or, or through the assistant treasurer's position? So um, no, I, th I think part of it, Jen, is just, just retooling and taking a look again and, and looking at job descriptions and making sure that, you know, when we advertised months ago, um, it was still a full-on treasure collector plus. Um, mm -hmm. Now I think it'll probably go back towards more of a, a traditional treasure collector role. Okay. And so then we're not talking about doing any modifications to the salary offered. Yeah. So the treasure collector, I think, where we have been paying now um, with Becky, um, I think is competitive to what a traditional treasure collector is making. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at the market and we see some of the other treasure collectors that are making the upwards of $100,000, they are also treasure collector slash HR director, or they are treasure collector and finance director position. So um, to both of your points, they do have increased responsibilities. Thus comes the additional expectation and compensation. Okay. So just to be clear, we're looking at modifying our what we're looking for as far as the job itself, where we don't need the HR piece. We don't need. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that helped, Clara. So if we're looking at a basic position and we're not doing HR, we're not doing payroll stuff, then if they're getting paid 115 to do all that, 
then they shouldn't expect to get 115 here just to do a basic job, so to speak. So um, that settles me a little bit more. Yeah. And I think I discussed the other night, I mean, there's, we um, have been, and not just related to this position, but a lot of other town departments, um, communities have reached out for possible partnership opportunities for a lot of the, the services and positions that we have. Um, you know, I just, an example is CMRPC, and they haven't reached out to us on this, but CMRPC offers a regional accounting service. And that was kind of sparked by the market for town accountants is incredibly competitive, and CMRPC saw an opportunity for partnerships with their communities for that service. So I also think that the industry as well is moving towards that. I mean, you think of comparable positions in the private sector. Um, they are work from home or very hybrid and um, some other benefits that are associated with the um, private sector attractiveness that the public sector hasn't quite caught up with. Whereas a regional partnership offers some of those benefits um, that maybe aren't traditionally recognized in the public sector. So we've had some discussions on, on some of those opportunities as well. Any other questions on that, Harry? No, I just, I guess I'm, I'll say I'm a little old school. When municipalities were starting out, they didn't have a lot of money, so they made a lot of benefits. Today, you're applying for it, you're getting all the benefits, and you want the pay of an outside private company. Doesn't kind of make sense to me. Doesn't flow, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I, I guess that's where I'm having a hard time coming to grasp with somebody says, yeah, I'm going to get my pension, sick pay, 27 different benefits, but I also want this. That's not the way it was designed originally. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a challenge of, of, of I think, one of your goals is modernizing town government. And I think a part of that is also recognizing what that means and sometimes it's benefits, sometimes it's pay, sometimes it's just overall how we operate. And it's definitely a, a, a change structurally to an organization like Rutland. But, um, you know, we've got to figure out a way to keep up somehow. And that may be some of them or, um, again, just trying to be mindful of what we do offer um, and maybe promoting that a little bit more. Um, there's certainly some things that you know, maybe we do that other communities don't offer. Um, and that's, I think, also part of our recruitment strategy is just to, to um, really emphasize the, the benefits of working in Rome. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a very, a very diff a difficult path to go down in that you're caught between a rock and a hard place. And for a municipality, and again, I come back to, if this is what we have to do, then it's not us me pers I'm paying a little of that bill, but the town is paying the bill. And that's where I get a little concerned is that as a, as a board, do we say to the town, we have to do this, so suck it up. You got to pay the bill. Yeah. Or how do we work with that to make sure the town doesn't really get hurt too bad and still accomplish our goals? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, this is. I'm not. I don't envy you. You know that. Job. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not suggesting this at all, but the town of Harborston, their town accountant lives in Florida, and not only does she live in Florida, she works for four other communities in Massachusetts mm -hmm. remotely, um, which is like I think to me that would drive me crazy because there's something nice about on Fridays I can go see Donna. Yeah. Um, so that is like even for me. And I'm like, totally like, let's modernize things. That would be something that even is like a line for me. Like, no, I want my accountant close. Um, or I want to be able to like see a document that she gives me. Um, yeah. But even like nearby towns are doing it. Um, so I think at some point we'll have to figure out ways to be creative too. But okay. um, I'll just quickly roll through the rest. So as, as everyone knows, I presented the uh, FY25 budget. Uh, to the board and to the finance committee last Thursday. Um, 
the presentation and budget book, again, are available online at rutlandemory.gov slash finance. Uh, also made some updates over the weekend to the budget book. Um, so I want to make sure that if you haven't had a chance to check it out, go check it out. If you want us to print you a new fancy uh, budget book, we can certainly do that. Um, well, that was a question I had. Can a budget book be printed for a citizen of the town? Sure. I think I don't think everybody's going to ask. I think we've got to be but, mindful of our supplies budget. Um, yeah. I think Tamika was probably mad at me when the paper was all gone the other night. But um, <laughs> it was for a good cause. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the only um, thing you get. You don't get another one. Okay. <laughs> and that was with typos. So it was like drove me crazy as soon as we printed those and I saw a typo. But um, yeah, certainly I think we could try to, to make a few. I mean, I just personally, I'm. They should come in and ask for it to see if they can do it. Yeah. It's not up for me to say anything. Yeah. You know, or tell them to go to the library. And yeah. to, or another town's library. I do wonder if there might be value to having one Couple. printed at the library, like at the town clerk's office and maybe the council on aging or something, just Good, that people can stop in and look at it, but it stays there. You know what I mean? It's like the right. town off town office's copy and the library copy and the council on aging copy, and that way people can flip through it as... <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, as far as the financial pieces are concerned, you really have to be adept at understanding assets and cash flow and bottom line numbers to get a lot of this stuff. And most of the people don't want to get involved in that. So the other stuff is good for them to read what's going on and that stuff. So I agree it should not you know, would be nice to have a copy there. Yeah, hopefully there's a lot of tools in there that are helpful in, in having people understand the budget, document and the process overall. I mean, the glossary of terms, the guide to the budget, and some other things that um, probably a CPA would say, well, this is kind of like nothing to me. But right. for folks who have never read a municipal budget before, hopefully that's helpful for them. So, And you have some good narrative that explains a little bit of, of the process and everything also. So yeah. it's a good kind of primer intro to people who don't, you know. Yeah, and also at a town meeting, they've had a chance to review this online and everything else. So some of the questions we get might be easier or easier answered when it's been available for them. Yep. Yep. And I'm happy that we started early. Um, we have a budget document available, you know, months in advance for people to digest. And as we go through the kind of the public hearings and other meetings, People are familiar with what uh, what the board and finance committee are requesting of them. So, thanks for your support again through this whole process. Um, and again, we'll we'll be meeting with the finance committee staff. Will be meeting on Monday for a public hearing. Um, all town departments will have an opportunity to present their budgets uh, to the FinCom uh, and the general public if they choose to attend. Um, in the in my report, I just also have some of the dates for the Wachusett School District. Uh, budget process. Um, I think the next the next date is the uh, meeting with some of the finance officials, town finance officials, on February 29th, uh, and then early March they'll go through the uh, public hearing process as well on the school side, and there will be the budget presentation from Wachusett and Bay Path on Thursday, March 14th, uh, here in the library. Um, just quickly rolling through some of the projects that we have going on. Um, you'll recall that. We went out to bid for the public safety and library roof repair project. Um, due to timing, there were no bidders on the previous bidding process. We'll be going out to bid again starting on February 8th. Bid opening is scheduled for March 14th. We're hopeful that this is a, a better time window for people to bid on it as um, contractors are preparing their work schedule for this year. Um, and that was a project funded by ARPA. Um, we, town staff, have also been working with CMRPC in the Wachusa School District. I notified the board months ago that they're working on a demogra demographics and facility study, kind of taking a look at some of the growth expected for all of the communities um, and, and uh, preparing um, phases two and three of the report, which will provide recommendations and solutions to uh, improving some of the facilities um, and services overall. Um, you know, some of the recommendations, just to name a few, is um, sharing of services between um, town and school district, for example. There's some duplicate, duplicated efforts, for example, if you were to say IT or, or um, finance, for example. Uh, is there an opportunity to share some of those services with the school district? 
Um, and the town planner and I attended an economic development meeting last month. Um, it was a request of EDC to attend, uh, not only to meet John, uh, but also to um, talk about some of the work that they intend to complete over the next year. Um, I think when their committee was, uh, when the commission was created um, two years ago, um, it was a very broad charge. There was a lot of things on their charge that um, were either redundant or maybe weren't totally relevant to economic development. So um, John and I said, well, why don't we kind of narrow this a little bit for the board to consider? Uh, so they, I think they're, they're meeting uh, this week to discuss um, some of the revisions to the charge and we'll come back to the board to request for a revision of, um, of their scope. Um, they also are working with John to apply for a DLTE grant from uh, CMRPC to develop a business brochure for the community, highlighting some of the business opportunities we have here in Rutland. Um, and then uh, included in your packet is also uh, an upcoming discussion point. I know we had been talking for a while about policies. Uh, we worked with um, the finance team and town departments to develop a draft set of financial policies that are included in your packet. There's a lot there. Um, so asking the board to take a, take a look at that and see if there's any comments you have. And then um, ideally at a future meeting, we can have a kind of a first reading of some of these policies and, um, and kind of get to implementing some of these. Some of these are already policies and practices that we have now, um, just revising them or formalizing them a little bit. Uh, and some of them are new policies that we're suggesting for the community. And so did we keep a lot of the old policies or some of the old policies in the financial? When it was put together eight years ago, yeah. nine years ago? Um, so we kept most, if not all, of the policies. We just, um, I think, modified the structure um, and you know either uh, condensed them into other policies that are in here. But every policy that we have now is in included in some respects um, within this new draft policy document. Okay. May I ask that the, this draft also gets shared with FinCom, just as they are kind of the ones that were originally behind the, the, the charge behind leading the creation of them, and just to make sure that yep. we're all... Yeah. This process was started by attending a finance committee meeting um, and asking them to review and provide any comments on existing policies. We didn't receive any. Um, so certainly, I think we can also attend and, and talk about some of these policies with them as well and get their recommendations, comments, or thoughts to forward to the board as well. I know they have a lot going on right now, but I just feel like yeah. it's beneficial to yeah. have. Just le leaving through it real quick, debt limits. We do have a debt policy in place right now, so that's kind of going to go away and be incorporated into this document. Okay. okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does Jen, do you have any questions for Austin on any of his this reports? Will be a good read. I'll fall asleep. <laughs> no questions. I, I'd like to review the draft document that Austin provided in more detail. I haven't had a chance to really go through it yet. Yeah, it's. I kind of view this as kind of the first reading, and whether we have it on our next agenda meeting or even the one after for adoption, or depending on how FinCom, you know, gets, I would like to have at least them to have an opportunity to see it before Absolutely. adopting it. But yeah. um, and then to our um, kind of ongoing conversation, I think the next big set of policies will be the HR um, and personnel policies. And then I need to go through and look at all the bylaw changes that reference policy um, so that when if when if they pass in a week and a half, we can have those policies in place by the time the AG would adopt the bylaws. So kind of by the, the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, can Peter help us with that? Um, I had asked him if he could pull them out. So yeah, um, okay. yeah, yeah. So at least we know what we need to be looking at. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, can I just yeah. divert for a second? On the budget, 2025 budget booklet, you had asked for comments by the 11th? The 7th. 7th. 7th? This Wednesday. Is that Possible. a definite hard date? 
I mean, I'm only into about 20 pages so far, and I have like six questions. Can you read it on two, two times speed? No. <laughs> um, you know, no, so that was a, that message candidly was essentially more for the finance committee to um, make sure that the town departments are prepared in advance of the public hearing set for Monday. Okay. Um, but, you know, certainly I think uh, – my expectation is that after Monday, I'm sure that there will be additional questions as well as whether I mean, it's from the community or from the board. Yeah, I mean um, a lot of a lot of the stuff like take the last third. Yep. that's all basic backup information. Yeah, it's not so. Yeah. I don't expect I'll have too many more than that, but mm -hmm. just some things, not hard questions, just kind of some clarification on stuff. Yeah, this is essentially kind of just the beginning of the public process. So, okay. um, so yeah, if you need more time. Um, uh, for questions, uh, but. probably, you know, Friday. Okay. You know, today's the fifth, so it's only two days. Friday could be fine. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because if it is, I'll push hard. But I'd prefer to do a better job reading it and understanding. Yeah. Just pushing questions. Yep. Out. I think some of the consideration with doing Wednesday, Austin, correct me if I'm wrong, was because it gave staff adequate time to to provide to gather and provide the information for the answers, right. um, whereas if getting the questions on Friday, then they have essentially a, a, a working day on Monday to get stuff for, prepared for that meeting and not have any information necessarily disseminated out or anything also. So I think that I think was... most of my questions can be answered very quickly yeah. from top of knowledge. You know, they don't have to dig into stuff. But I think that that was the rationale of providing, trying yeah. to provide us as board, the board and FinCom time to review, but then also staff time to provide documentation or answers. When you were a selectman, did your TA provide this kind of information to you, a book like this? Or when you were in, was it AIR or Acton? Acton, Acton yeah. Did you receive stuff like this or were you Yep. I'm trying to think how you'd come together putting the book together. Um, so this this mirrors, I think, my own interest in financial best practices, um, but also some of the work that I did mostly in Acton. Um, I developed their budget book okay. um, in conformance with um, GFOA yeah. best practices, so I okay. kind of wanted to bring that here. But every town does it differently. Um, you no, know, I mean, it is conforming with GMO for, yep. so we can kind of meet that criteria. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me, may I ask a quick question? Yeah. Is the select board wanting me to post Monday, post an agenda for you on Monday as well? It was my understanding that it was the finance committee, but if there's questions, I'm wondering if you do want me to post an agenda, I, I just want to make sure. Um, I, I always... <laughs> This is we go back and forth every year, I think, and it's been either or. Um, I don't think it would necessarily hurt to post that way if we do have a quorum there, um, and there's conversation that that leads, then we're we're posted and we're covered. Um, I will plan on being there, but I think also I might have a school committee commitment. I'm not sure if I have to be there or not, um, and so that way. You know, any one of us can go or any group of us can go and ask questions for individual knowledge. But then if that leads into a conversation with the, that the rest of the board is engaged in, then that's where it gets not cool. So I think it's better to post and be safe. And if we don't have a quorum or whatever, then it's no, no big deal. Okay. Is that okay? with Jenna, are you okay with that? I don't know if you, you're planning to attend on Monday or not. If I can, it will probably be remotely. Okay. No, and that's fine. I know we've had a, a, a again, it's, we're back into a lot of meetings. And so, but I think if you don't mind posting. No, I don't mind at all. I just wanted to make sure I was on the same page as the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for asking. Um, so then, any other conversation for the town administrator update? Um, just a question. A couple of meetings ago, uh, RDIC was here. And we were questioning them, and some comments got heated. And we looked at some frustration from the RDIC in terms of how they move forward with what they're doing. And I believe we had said something that let's kind of get them back here and talk to them so we can get them moving forward if there's any kind of 
frustration or misunderstanding they have because RDIC has some land there yet. A, a, I believe EDC is working on other stuff. Am I correct? So my feeling is, because I'm hearing from town people like the woman we had in the audience, where are what's going on? How come we haven't tax money coming in? So I think we need to work with them, if possible, to find out what's going on so that we can move them forward. Okay? Uh, if we can schedule them for a meeting. However, I don't know. I'm just saying I'd like to revisit that because I feel like it was just dropped and that was it. So we can look at a calendar, Tamika, and see. I know John, I think, was um, trying to work a little bit with them and just better understand that property and what goes along with that property, how it's been deeded and, and set up. Um, and so I didn't want to jump and have the town planner come in and not necessarily. doesn't have to be your next, you know, I'm just saying. Right, yeah, yeah. We need to get that yeah, yeah. somehow moving yeah. forward with them. Yeah, I'll put that on my little yeah. reminder thing to pop up at a certain time so we can touch base okay. with John and, and Mike. And God bless you. Appreciate and, that. Um, figure that out. Yeah, yeah we can do that. Um, moving into old business, we're going to revisit, as the Board of Public Works, we're going to revisit the continued discussion of the water abatement request, which we had seen um, last meeting, and I believe there was some questions um, as to why it should be um, abated um, when all of the documentation seems to actually show to point to the usage was correct, the billing was correct. Um, and so we, I think, asked if there was any additional, if the residents would be willing to provide any additional information to Mika. Um, yes, I did reach out to the residents after the last meeting, and unfortunately, I did not hear any correspondence back from them. I did also um, send an invitation to attend tonight's meeting, um, and there's nobody here. Um, so unfortunately, I have no new information to provide the board. Um, I mean, on a personal note, my water bill has doubled over the last two years. You know, and that's that's a big hit. Mm -hmm. So I can understand the frustration of having to pay more money, but it's not like. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that stuff are surcharges there too. You know, those are not going to go away no matter what you repeat the cost mm -hmm. on. So. And, I mean, I think just to reiterate, DPW had gone out and checked for leaks and reinstalled a water meter, um, checked the water meter to sh ensure that it was functioning properly, found that everything was, did not find any leaks, found that the water meter was functioning properly. Going back and looking kind of at the historical usage, there were, when they had a functioning water meter, there were blips that, a few months at a time that it, their usage would almost double and that's mm -hmm. what they're seeing now um it's their baseline is higher than it was a few what was that like three or four years ago that they had a functioning water meter so um and again because of the infrastructure and i and i and all the other stuff that got packed on over the last two years that three or four years ago really can't be applied to now and i was just looking cost. at I was just looking at usage and not so much the dollar amounts because yeah. to your point, stuff does change. Um, and, you know, so I, I guess I personally am not necessarily, like, unfortunately not in favor of abatement um, in this case, again, because then I feel it opens the, the door to everybody coming in saying, well, I think our usage is way over. And if DPW is happy to work with the, the property owners to do all the checks and everything, and if that comes back as null, then I, I don't know. Um, I was, uh, I am glad the board decided to give them a second chance to, to apply if there were any other reasons or any other issues they felt compelled that would affect us. And since we haven't heard back from them, I kind of have to agree with you. Uh, we just think can't be held on forever, so mm -hmm. we gave them every opportunity we could. Mm -hmm. So, and I know if it's a financial hardship piece, the DPW and Treasure Collector um, are more than willing to work uh, not just on property taxes, but with utility bills as well for payment plans and everything. So it's just right. that that line of communication, um, and 
there's you know I don't know what I don't know what their circumstances are if they qualify for any anything or or not but um, <coughs> there there's potentially opportunities there if they reach out to DPW treasurer collector assessors whatever so well, I'm happy that the board decided to give them another opportunity which apparently they just didn't take advantage of at this time so. Um, so, um, Jen, do you have any, I know, we. I think we all kind of had the same questions, concerns last meeting. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to address. Uh, no, I think you guys have, have gone over just, I, I have all the same comments. I mean, the, the reason for abatement is just noting that the amount is over previous bills, which is to be expected, especially since for I don't know, however many months, or quarters there, they were getting estimated readings, which were on the low end. So anything now, I mean, and even if we were to to do anything about this particular bill, it's, you know, what about the next one that's not, that's also higher than, it, like you said, there, there's no, no evidence to show that it's not being used, so. So we don't have to make a motion or anything, we just take no action. Yeah. Um, I I would make a motion to take no action, okay. just to have a formal vote, and then I will document that for the file if if the board's okay with that. Um, I uh, make a motion that we take no action on the water uh, sewer abatement uh, for client unnamed. So I don't know who they are. As presented. As presented. As presented. Okay. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any other, you know, I just want to reiterate, unfortunately, with the information that we have, this is a decision that right. we need to make in the interest for the entirety of town and the utilities and that there are opportunities, if it's a financial hardship, to reach out to DPW, yeah. treasurer, collector, assessors, or, you know, Tamika or one of us if they need assistance navigating any of that. So. I mean, I just, again, want to make it to the citizens of this town that we gave them every effort we, we really did a great job at evaluating this and unfortunate conclusion is no action so uh, we have a motion and a second roll call harry second i ledger i whiteman i with regrets um and i thank the board for giving that extra time to the citizen of course um, and thank you, Tamika, and to DPW staff for kind of yeah. the, the back and forth also. Mm -hmm. um, moving into new and special business, we have a request from the town clerk to sign the election warrant for the March 5th, 2024 presidential primary election. Um, so this is something we generally just standardly do. So we need a motion to sign. I'll make a motion to sign the election warrant for March 5th, 2024 uh, primary election. Motion, is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Roll call. Second, I. Ledger, I. And Whiteman, I. Thank you. Um, I had asked if we could open the Moses Howe Award for Excellence in Public Service. Um, Tamika, I was wondering if we could actually push the closing out to after the closing of the um, the uh, in memorandum and dedication pages, um, just to give people a little bit more time. But I'm not totally married to it. I meant to email you and I forgot. So no, the, I'll do whatever the board wants to do. Um, I think generally we leave it open for about a month. Generally for this one, um, and since we're doing the awarding in. Um, at the first gen I think we decided to try to do it at the first concert that would be the middle of June so if we could maybe if you're okay with that sorry I didn't no that's fine um I think for the the dedication and in memoriam I would prefer to have them a little bit sooner yep. um because I'll need the board to vote on it and that's part of my process of putting together the the book yep. um so well, this is for the annual report right correct okay yeah so I 100% I'm fine with the annual report stuff. But okay. then for this, the Moses Howe, this just the Moses Howe award. Mm -hmm. If we could keep that open through till 
I don't know what our first meeting, so that maybe we could have it on our first meeting in March. Sixth? Yeah. The next meeting? Yeah. Uh, uh, March 4th, maybe. Uh, let's March. see. It says oh, March 4th. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, geez. I put it on the paper myself and didn't <laughs> even know what I was talking about. So this is uh, an award that a former selectman, Jeff Stillings, had created. Um, he originally created it to kind of honor public service. Um, as in public service employees, and then we kind of expanded it to be um, open to the broader community, um, but with a public a service to the public in mind. Um, this can be a living or posthumously awarded um, award. We've had a mix of both. Um, so we can, uh, I think Tamika has a form online, mm -hmm. um, and in, in the past we've asked residents to kind of nominate individuals, um, give a little synopsis, um, and then at our meeting that I just asked if we could extend, <laughs> um, Absolutely, that's fine. on March 4th, the board would have the entire packet of the nominations, mm -hmm. um, and then we could have a, a conversation and a vote as to who would receipt be the recipient um in the past if the recipient is living they're in they're included in the award ceremony obviously and if it's posthumously awarded their family um is there to re to be receive it on their behalf um so this is officially opening um if the board is amenable officially opening nominations for the and it's actually the 2023 Moses Howe Awards because it's the previous yes. year. And that's always one of those things that we, in our brain, always mess up. Like, <laughs> town report, yes. warrant, current <laughs> schedule. Like, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Budget. So this is, if you can look from January 2023 through December of 2023, and um, a resident uh, a resident or employee um, who has really exemplified service to the public. Um, and think about that. We would love a whole host of nominations. Yeah. <laughs> so now that the board has officially opened it, um, there'll be information right on the homepage of the website tomorrow. Um, a news, an email news blast will go out. We'll have it on social media. Um, so it'll be very easily accessible for any anybody that wants to submit a form. Awesome. Thank you. And sorry to throw those changes at you. I No, that's no problem at all. And I also left it so that if somebody wants to remain anonymous, they can. They're not obligated to put their own name in there because I know sometimes people prefer to remain yep. anonymous. So that's an option too. No. I appreciate that. Oh. Jen and Harry, I think that you guys are new to the board since the board's been doing the Moses Howe Award. Do you have any questions or anything kind of about, about the award and the process? Um, it describes on their website the Moses Howe Award and the application stuff? Yes. So can, yeah, can there's a photo that. with a little history of, of Mr. Moses Howe and then um, just explaining, you know, what it means and, and the calendar year and things like that. And yeah. if anyone's interested, there's a nice... Uh, s Mr. Stillings had a big plaque made mm -hmm. um, that hangs in the public safety building. Uh, when you walk in the door to the left above the flag retirement stand or um, bin, and there's engravable pieces. And so for every recipient, they get their name in the calendar year that they're, they're the recipient engraved. Okay. Thank you, Tamika. Jen, did you have any questions or anything? No, nothing from me. Thank you. Um, and then we have a request the, to sign a retail liquor license. Uh, if you remember, Schultz Farm had come before us and asked for authorization for a liquor license and then had to go to the ABCC, the state level. They were granted approval by the AC, ABCC, and for us as a local licensing authority, we need to sign the retail liquor license. So and Leah, I was just going to note. So I used the same hours on the liquor license as other uh, entities who also have their license under the agricultural accessory bylaw, just to remain equitable okay. across the board. And I think that that provides an opportunity then for um, when they're up for renewal or anything, or if they want to have a conversation with us as the licensing authority yes. to change 
um, for the liquor license itself. And I also wanted to note, I did review their site plan approval and there is no uh, condition in there specific to the hours of operation. Okay. So it doesn't conflict with anything that's in the site plan approval. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Those are some um, of the learning curves that we yes, had. Yes, that we found year. along the way. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure that I confirmed that before I brought it before okay. you guys. So Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you have any questions? No, I just had a thought that on that site plan approval, that land happens to be APR land, uh, protected land. Mm -hmm. It's a state issue, not our issue. Correct. So the site plan is really just with us, nothing to do with so. Correct. It's if specific something goes to the wrong town, the state level, that's their problem. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And the site plan actually is a planning board thing. Mm -hmm. We are the licensing authority for the liquor license. So really the only real control select board has currently is the liquor licensing authority. Right, but, but I was curious is that if anything happened at the state level, because it's done by the ABC C right. That's their issue. Right. We, have, we don't have to worry about anything. Right. Okay. Jen, did you have any questions? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Then I would take a motion to sign the retail liquor license for um, Schultz Farm at 163 Maple Ave. So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. And Jen seconded. Is there any other questions, comments, or concerns? Hearing none, roll call, Harry. Sackman, aye. Ledger, aye. Whiteman, aye. Um, and I think that's all for our agenda. I just want to say that our future meetings are um, February 12th is a budget hearing. It's FinCom meeting. We may be there. Um, that's here in the library. Uh, February 15th at 6 p.m., is our winter special town meeting for our bylaw review, um, our, our bylaw updates. Uh, that's here um, in the lower level in the Blair Room of the library. Uh, February 20th is our next regular scheduled meeting. That's a Tuesday following President's Day. Then we look at March 4th um, and then out to March 5th, 14th with a joint meeting with um, FinCom and the school districts. Um, I think this Sunday there is the final public information hearing for the bylaw, the proposed bylaw changes. Mm -hmm. That would be Sunday the 11th um, from 1 to 4 here in the library. Um, there should also be a Zoom option for that as well. Um, is there any other business to come before the board? Hearing none, I want to thank you for a good meeting tonight. I think we had a lot of good conversation, and we have some big action items going forward, but I think it's stuff that has been rolling around for a while, so we'll have some continued big things going on. So thank you all. Happy February. Thank you. And I would take a motion to adjourn. I uh, yeah. make a motion we adjourn. I'll second. Motion and a second. Roll call, Harry. Second, I. Ledger, I. Whiteman, I. We're adjourned at 7.58 p.m.